the price of gold has surged to new highs this year, and the 28% return is nearly eight times the return on the stock market. In fact, the only thing beating gold is the return on silver with a 50% return this year. In this video, I'll show you how to decide whether to invest in gold, silver, or even both. We'll look at the gold-silver ratio and all the factors driving prices higher. We're talking precious metals investing today on Let's Talk Money. Hey, Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here with the Let's Talk Money channel. I want to send a special shout out to all you in the nation. Thank you for spending a part of your day to be here. If you're not part of that community yet, just click that little red subscribe button. It's free and you'll never miss an episode. Nation, prices for gold and silver are surging this year, both as safety plays during the pandemic and as protection against the massive inflation that could be coming our way. In fact, we talked about investing in gold in an interview with Gold Mining Inc. CEO Amir Adnani just four weeks ago, highlighting some of the changes that he's seen in the industry. He talked about a strategy within the miners and with gold mining in particular, with shares of the company surging 40% since the interview. But since that video, I've gotten a lot of questions from you in the nation about investing in gold versus silver, uh, which is the better investment and how to decide. Now, a lot of you have brought up the gold-silver ratio, so I wanted to use this video to give you everything you need to invest in precious metals. In this video, I'm going to show you the factors driving gold and silver prices higher, how to analyze each and decide which to buy. I'll explain that gold-silver ratio, how to use it to know which to buy, and how you could have used it to make a 31% return this year with very little risk. I'm also going to be highlighting some of the upsides to investing in gold miners later in the video, especially Gold Mining Inc. Uh, that's ticker GLDLF in the US market and then GOLD in the Toronto market. Now, besides some really strong project production, the company is creating a royalty trust that is going to spin off cash flow to investors very soon. So, so be sure to stick around to hear about that. Before we begin, though, I want to see where you're at with investing in gold or silver. What are the ways you've invested in these, whether through physical gold, coins, ETFs, or the miners themselves? Have you invested in gold or silver or both? So scroll down and let me know in the comments below if you've invested in gold or silver, how you did it, whether through those physical investing ETFs or shares of the miners. So the jump in the price of gold has been the big news of 2020, and the last time we saw this multi-year bull market, the price increased nearly 600% over the decade to 2011. Even after the run this year, though, prices are just 83% off that 2015 low, with analysts at Goldman predicting prices could reach three or $4,000 an ounce. So nation, that typical cycle in gold and precious metals prices usually starts with the fundamentals that we'll talk about, uh, the increase in central bank buying, the dollar devaluation, and the inflation. The second leg higher, though, is then from investor demand, and that's the piece that I think could drive prices higher very soon. We could still be in the beginning stages of this bull market, so let's look at the factors driving those silver and gold prices. Then I'll explain the gold-silver ratio and how to use it to make that riskless investment. Now for gold, the supply side is easy. The World Gold Council estimates that 190,000 tons of gold have been mined, with about two-thirds of that since 1950. Since gold is pretty much indestructible, virtually all the gold ever mined is still in circulation. A bar chart of supply shows just how consistent this is. Every year, mine production adds about another 3,500 tons of gold and about 1,000 tons is recycled. So if you're looking at that consistent supply growth of less than 2% each year. Now with this consistency in supply, understanding gold prices is all about demand. It's in those four primary uses, jewelry, technology, investment, and central bank buying that really drive the price of gold higher or lower. Short term, from year to year, the price of gold is going to follow those changes in demand from these four uses. Longer term, though, the price is generally going to rise with that inflation and the constant addition of the new demand for jewelry, tech hardware, and government holdings. So to see why gold has been rising over this last year, we only have to look at the different users. Central banks have been buyers for 10 consecutive years, and 2018 saw the largest purchases since Nixon closed the gold window in 1971. Now, this is really where I see a lot of the support on the price over the next decade, especially China and Russia, but most of the central banks around the world are just trying to diversify their reserves away from the US dollar. There's really no other reserve currency that's as stable, so they're increasingly turning to more gold in their reserve vaults. Gold held in ETFs has grown by 400 tons last year to a record of almost 2,900 tons, and investor demand has picked up on that global uncertainty. Lately, that investor demand has skyrocketed from the coronavirus and stocks falling into that correction territory. Demand from technology is fairly consistent and follows that general business cycle. And more tech and electronic products created just means more demand for gold as a conductor. 
In fact, jewelry is really the only demand driver where we see that significant decrease last year, uh, with demand lower by about 133 tons due to the higher prices that we saw on the market. Now turning to silver, we see the supply and demand picture here. Like gold, silver production is extremely consistent, with total supply growing at less than half a percent a year. There's some fluctuation in mining as producers pull back on spending when prices are lower, but, but combined with recycling, it's a fairly stable add each year to total supply. Silver demand, though, is much more as an industrial metal compared to gold, which makes it more cyclical. More than half the overall demand for silver, 51.5%, goes to industrial applications like electronics and photovoltaics. Another 26% of the demand for silver goes to jewelry and silverware, and investment accounts for about 20% from year to year. So these are those underlying fundamentals that really drive gold and silver prices. But I also want to talk about something that's hugely important to investors, that gold-silver ratio. This ratio is the price of gold divided by the price of an ounce of silver, or it's also commonly defined as the number of ounces of silver that you'd need to sell to buy that one ounce of gold. And this gold-silver ratio has been a great tool for deciding when to invest in gold versus silver and can actually give you some lower risk returns. We see here the gold-silver chart back to about 1995. The gold-silver ratio is now at 72 times, which means since gold is priced at about $1,959 an ounce and silver around $27, then the price of an ounce of gold is 72 times the same quantity of silver. And you can see that this relationship has fluctuated between that 50 to 75 times over the last 25 years, with only occasional events or trends taking it higher or lower. But Nation, that's where the real opportunity is when you're investing in gold versus silver, how where you can get those returns of 20 and 30% with even lower risk. As an example, beginning in 2020, you would have seen that the price of gold was trading at 120 times more expensively than that per ounce of silver. Gold was trading at about 1,500 an ounce, while silver was down at 1,250 per ounce. That breakdown in the gold-silver ratio, way above where it's usually at, was a huge opportunity. Using the ETF funds, the ticker SLV for silver and GLD for gold as proxies, you could have bought shares of the silver ETF for $16.81 and sold shares of the gold fund at $144 per share. To September, you would have made a 50% return on that silver fund, while only a 28% loss on the gold ETF for a net return of 22%. So using this gold-silver ratio as a trading strategy, you're not taking that risk that the price of precious metals are going to go up or down. You're investing in that pricing difference that it's going to return to a more normal level where it's been in the past. In effect, you're taking out all the risk and the fundamentals out of the investment. Now, since the beginning of this year, while the price of gold has risen, it hasn't risen nearly as fast as the price of silver. So that gold-silver ratio has come back down from that 120 at the beginning of the year back down to 72, and that's where that 22% return has come from. If the price of silver were to keep climbing faster than gold, and maybe this ratio keeps falling to maybe 50 times, then I would definitely be buying gold and selling silver at that point. But that gold-silver ratio only tells us if there's a breakdown in that pricing relationship between the two metals. When it's around this mid-level, around 75 times, it doesn't tell us if either is a good or a bad investment against the other, but that doesn't mean you can't still make money. For that, we just have to go back to the fundamentals to see if those big picture clues are going to push the price of both gold and silver higher over the next year. And besides that central bank buy-in that should support gold prices over the longer term, we see other factors that are going to boost prices near term as well. The U.S. government, and in fact the governments all around the world, are going at that pandemic as if it were a war, and considering the loss of life on this thing, that analogy probably isn't too far off. We've already had $3 trillion plus in government spending, plus $4 trillion in stimulus by the Fed, and if you look at that level the spending has done in the past, inflation has jumped after four of the last five wars. Only after the Gulf War did inflation come back down, and that was because of those lower oil prices. And while inflation hasn't been a problem yet, all the warning signs are there. The Federal Reserve usually increases the amount of money in the system by just under 5% a year, but has borrowed so much that the money supply has jumped 8% just in the last few months. And those fundamentals pushing the price of gold and silver up are starting to get the investor attention that we talked about earlier. The central bank buying, the inflation expectations, this is all responsible for that 28 to 50% run in these precious metals and, and could take prices higher, but the next surge in prices, that's going to be from investor demand trying to get in front of this bull market. And analysts are rushing to upgrade their forecasts, with some saying gold above 5,000 an ounce is possible in the next year or two. Bank of America and RBC Capital both have gold in that $3,000 range over the next year, and silver as high as $50 an ounce. 
Now I do prefer gold over silver here on that central bank buying. So until the gold silver ratio gets maybe above 90 again, I'll be buying gold rather than silver. If the gold silver ratio does rise above 90, I'd start selling gold and then buying silver. Or if the ratio conversely moves lower than 50, I'd probably start selling silver, but right now I'm just buying gold. And we've talked about a few ways to do that in previous videos, uh, investing in physical gold. So buying those bars and coins, that's always an option, but it's also the more expensive alternative. With physical gold, you're paying for storage as well as up to 4% just to buy or sell your gold. Now that's gonna mean gold needs to rise upwards of 10% just to break even after those costs. You can also buy the gold or silver ETFs, which are the funds that hold physical gold and silver to give investors exposure to these assets. The iShares Silver Trust, ticker SLV, and the Spider Gold Shares, ticker GLD, both trade like stocks with a very low management fees, about half a percent or less. So it's a much cheaper way to get that exposure to prices. My favorite way to invest though is gonna be through those miners because as we talked about in that interview with the CEO of Gold Mining Inc., the miners give you that leveraged play and an investment in something that actually creates profits rather than just that physical gold that earns nothing until you sell it. For example, here you can see the Gold Miners ETF, that's ticker GDX in red, has outperformed the price of gold over the past year. The shares of the Gold Miners themselves have jumped 46% against that 35% increase in the price of gold. But find a really well-run miner like we did with Gold Mining Inc. and you can get returns even higher than the broader miner group. Here shares of Gold Mining Inc., that's ticker GOLD on the Toronto Exchange, have surged 113% over that same period. Now for silver miners, most of these aren't pure plays because the companies mine a lot of these other metals like gold and copper as well, but you've got miners like Pan American Silver, that's ticker PAAS, and First Majestic Silver, ticker AG, as potential plays on the theme. And for gold miners, I still like Gold Mining Inc., that's ticker GLDLF here in the US markets, uh, even after that run. The company has a great pipeline of projects throughout North and South America and has used the last 10 years of lower prices to buy more assets on the cheap with a total cost of acquisitions that's now a tenth the market value of assets. Gold Mining Inc. is also creating a royalty trust from its assets that will spin off cash flow to investors with upside from the resource expansion and new discoveries. Click on the video to the right to see that interview with the CEO of Gold Mining Inc. and some of the plans for the company. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.